way because we did create a brand. So you'll see what it looks like. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about the Munity community and um, the work that we've been doing in Seattle around a private, public private partnership called Vax Northwest, which includes the major partners are here, their logos are on this introductory slide. It included Group Health, which is actually now Kaiser Permanente Washington. We were acquired in the last year. Um, it's Seattle Children's Hospital, the Department of Health, the state of Washington's Department of Health within Reach, which is a big nonprofit that um, connects um, families with different types of resources. And then Best Starts Washington is an arm of the Washington chapter of American um, Academy of Pediatrics. So those are all the partners. I also want to acknowledge my um, colleague, Jenny Sheppy, who did a lot of the work around this project, and then Mackenzie Melton, who actually implemented the project. And do I use this? It just hit, is this that? Oh, to, oh, there. No? Okay, I'll use these ones. Okay, so today's um, presentation, I want to talk, do, I'll give a little background about the program. And then I will talk about the evaluation, because we actually implemented the program and we evaluated and have the results and they have been published. Um, I want to talk mainly about the key findings we've had and then I'll talk a little bit about related work and our next steps that we're undergoing right now. So, in terms of the background, Vax Northwest and the Immunity Community came about as a result of um, a growing alarm about the rate of vaccination in Washington State. And here's uh, slides illustrating what happened from 1999 to um, 2010, 2011, where we see this huge increase in counties that had vaccination rates over 10, uh, exemption rates from, from kindergarten at over 10%. Um, and that actually, I did add another slide from this year, so that actually somewhat persists. It went down, there were some policy, there's a number of things that went on, including the immunity community, and that went down, but we still have, this is by school districts, it's a little bit different data, but um, we still have school districts that where we have vaccination rates that are under 20% and, uh, and some of them as low as 50%. So we still have a major vaccine hesitancy, vaccine acceptance issue. But there was some bright light. We did some, um, some literature review and some work with focus groups. And what we found were a, couple, a number of things. One is that parents want to do what's best for their children, right? That's inherent in all of these actions that parents are taking. They're really trying to do what's best for their children and keep them healthy. And that parents get a lot of information from social networks. Um, most parents, the other thing is most parents do immunize their children. So that's something I think that gets lost in the rhetoric about this, is that most parents actually are immunizing their children. Um, and then the voice of immunization, immunizing um, parents often goes unheard. We hear a lot about the anti-vaxxers, but we don't hear a lot from all the parents who are vaccinating their children and, and doing it without any questions. So we really wanted to, to promote that and think of, use that piece of information to um, help promote vaccination. And the other thing we found in focus groups is that parents who vaccinate actually became very activated when they learned about herd immunity and learned about issues around anti-vaccination. So they were a primed group to be able to activate to um, address this issue. So we created the immunity community. And I'm not sure in listening to my colleagues that we actually went through all of the very many stages of social marketing, but we definitely have many of those pieces integrated. We did the upfront research. I'm not sure we targeted very specific groups, but we did kind of think about who the audience was. And so we um, worked with a company called BCDC Ideas, which they specialize in social marketing around health issues, and we created the Immunity Community. And um, so obviously it's a play on community immunity or herd immunity. Um, the idea of being unity in both of these, the idea of creating community. You can see the little logo has people kind of joining their hands together. So that's our, um, our main logo. And then, oh, and so the whole program was centered around recruiting parent advocates, one or two, at different sites, basically elementary schools, childcare, and cooperative preschool. So where these are local communities, there's kind of micro communities where people gathered. 
And then we also focused on specific communities. So we used school districts as the kind of, as an idea of a kind of general community. So all the first year we picked one school district that had a kind of medium exec exemption rate because we didn't want to go into a place where there was going to be a lot of resistance. So medium exemption rate. And we, for, for two years, recruited sites. So those are daycares, elementary schools, and preschools. And then within those sites, we recruited one to two parent advocates to implement this uh, immunity community program. Um, and then the third year, we went to a, a second site. So it was piloted for three years, and that's when we had our rigorous evaluation going on. The immunity community actually continues today, so that's about three or four years past when our evaluation ended. Um, so we had created a whole suite of materials, and actually, Suzanne, can you? I have, I have some show and tells there. Um, one was a parent action guide, and this was used to train the parent advocates. <laughs> um, and so I only have one of the parent action guides, but you can, um, you can certainly come look at it. This was used, this is what was given to the parent advocates to help them learn how to um, engage the other parents in their communities. Um, this is a sticker that went at the schools, and they could say, We're entering, you're entering into an immunity community. So it would go on their, their window. And then there was all kinds of little swag. There's these little Band-Aid kits. Um, there's, I thought I saved, oh, I saved one for myself. There's a hand sanitizer. There's bags. There's kind of little swag to give out. And then there was, um, there's a whole bunch of different flyers which are going around. Two. And the first year, we um, had these cartoon characters. And as a part, let's see, oh, oops, I'm going to go back. And as a part of um, the feedback we got doing our focus groups, they, the parents asked for real parents. So we call, we then developed, and you'll see these around, the, our real families um, series of promotional materials. And we actually um, interviewed real families. We have videos on the, video, the site. Um, and so this is our Real Family series, and you'll see those as well. All right, and here, the final year, they developed these viral images, which are basically um, pieces of our two other campaign, you know, branding kind of images. And then they also added holiday series for every, so for every holiday. Somebody could post these viral images. So the one that says, nothing says love like getting vaccinated was sent out around um, Valentine's Day. So that was one of the last ads to the campaign. All right, so now I'm gonna move into the evaluation. And there were kind of four main aims of the evaluation. One was just to document the specific details of the intervention in order to facilitate spread and, and um, kind of be able to share the specifics of what happened. One, another was to provide informative feedback. Like I said, we took that feedback and then and improved the program as we went. A third was to gather evidence of the intervention's um, efficacy or desired outcomes. And I, like was mentioned earlier, we, we really knew we weren't going to be able to look at um, uh, kind of end outcomes. And we focused very much on the intermediate outcomes. And you'll see that as we go through the, the findings. And then we also wanted to identify best practices and factors that contributed to success. So we used a mixed method approach which involved a bunch of different uh, kind of data collection efforts. One was we went out and actually observed the parent advocates doing what they did at events and different things. We collected documentation from like their social media posts and different things that they were handing out. We actually had them track their activities. So we had a pretty com complex way that they tracked them, their activities, and they would go into this database and put in what they did each month, and they got a little incentive every month to do that. Um, we also track their track media using kind of the social media, you know, tracking mechanisms to see if any media kind of emerged as a result of the immunity community. Um, we did a parent survey, and I'll talk about that a little more. We did key informant interviews with all the parent advocates each year, as well as key stakeholders, um, like the program implementers and some of the, the oversight committee. And then finally, we did focus groups with parents each year at the end of each year. So some of the findings, this is a little, I think, hard, it gets a little bit busy, but basically one of our 
um, outcomes was just to successfully implement this program. We didn't even know if you could pull it off, right? So um, this shows that you know we had four sites recruited the first year. We had six parent advocates, the PA, another acronym, we, we call them PAs, which I know has many different meanings to different people, but the parent advocates, we had six. Um, we gave them their initial training. There was, they were given technical assistance, which was basically the help and support of the a program implementer. And there was the, the suite of initial suite of materials um, and a website. And then you can see each year we were able, they were able to expand the number of sites and the number of um, implementer, the number of parent advocates. Um, and we also expanded the, the amount of branded materials that are available. Another goal was for advocates to take action to raise awareness. And so when we were looking at their activities, we grouped them in three areas. One was to, for sites to monitor their vaccination rates. So this was a really interesting and important thing for them to do. So what they did was actually ask their school, do you keep track of our vaccination rates? And in some cases, they didn't. And then they also helped um, figure out systems for gathering that information and reporting it uh, and educating the parents, like, well, we do need to turn in this information so we know who's vaccinated in our school. Um, so that was one area. Another was just educating parents through different types of events or just one-on-one -on -one conversations. There was a lot of leeway they were given about how to do that. And then finally was having conversations on social media it turned out to be a very big area where parents got very engaged. This is another way to look at the activity. This was based on the, our activity tracking. And so you can see there's um, different kinds of activities like having conversations emailing, sending out emails to groups, um, handing out materials, holding events. Um, the main takeaway from this is that different pair, you can see there's a lot of variations. So different parent advocates felt different, felt had different levels of comfort doing these different things. So it was really good to have a wide variety of things for them to engage in so that they could do what was comfortable for them. And that's also why we ended up really recommending you have two parent advocates because then they would have different interests and um, kind of strengths and they could complement each other. I wanted to highlight this one parent advocate and I need to look up my notes here on her. <laughs> um, so this is Allison, she, this is actually her, she's very youthful looking. Um, she's a stay at home mom of three children and uh, they range from in age from six months to six years old uh, her husband's a family doctor, and her prior work experience was in education. And so she, in the course of one year, uh, reported having 17 conversations with other parents about vaccines, um, sending out 11 emails. She attended two events, or actually organized and had a booth. You can see her down at the booth, and we have this, we have this wheel of vaccines, and you actually sp the kids spin it and then they get a question about a certain kind of vaccine, and then they, if they get it right, they get it, well, they don't, I don't think we, I can't remember. I did it once at my, my kid's school. I don't think we cared whether they got it right or not, but then they got a prize, <laughs> a swag, like these, these balls, these wonderful little balls. Um, and I was amazed at how excited the kids were to do this, and they kept coming back. Um, so, so this is her at an event called Dirty Dan Days in Bellingham, Washington. Um, and she had five meetings with people. That's like going to PTA meetings or things like that. Uh, that's parent-teacher associations, in case that doesn't translate. Um, and then um, she did a lot of planning, so spent a lot of time planning, and then had 11 social media posts. So this is just kind of one little case study of what a parent, a kind of active parent advocate year might look like. Um, so I want to next talk about the survey. And so we did a pre-post cross-sectional survey with um, parents at, at these sites. And um, now I know a number of you are real strict methodologists and I will admit that we had a lot of issues with this survey, so I'm not saying it's perfect, but and we're working in a real world setting and we did the best we could. Um, so pre-post, cross-sectional, so we looked at, uh, we, we surveyed them when, the first year and then we surveyed them two years later at the, each site. And it depended when the site started. So some were surveyed, like had a post to the second year and the third year, and some just had it the, the second year because they entered later. So anyway, it gets complicated. But anyway, it's pre-post. And um, we had pretty low response rates. There's 24% for 
the pre and 13% for the post. Um, but so we had a total of 698 um, responses. There's 460 pre and 238 post. So, oops. So the purpose is really to look at um, parents' attitudes, behaviors, and knowledge around vaccines um, pre and post the program. And I already talked about response rates. And let's see, I am a qualitative researcher, so I did not do the analysis. <laughs> and I'm looking here to see. Um, there's a lot of details that I can talk to you about or they're in the paper, but, but basically we did a kind of pretty standard pre-post analysis. So here are some of the results. And um, so in terms of parent knowledge about vaccine-related issues, we saw an increase, and in, most of them were kind of vague trends in the right direction, but we did have one statistically significant change, which was in knowing the vaccination and exemption rates at their, at their child's school, which makes sense since they were trying to uh, increase that, and we saw a lot of activity in that area. Um, in terms of parental attitudes, we saw a lot more, the, the orange are the specific, statistically significant changes. Um, we saw increases in parents, uh, in the parents' concern that other parents were not vaccinating. We saw a decrease in those believing that vaccines were given to children who were too young. We saw the de a de decrease in those who feel it's a, response, it's a responsibility of individuals to choose to vaccinate rather than the, it's a kind of a group re um, responsibility and an increase in the number of parents reporting confidence in vaccinating as a good decision. And then we also saw a significantly st uh, statistically significant difference in the overall attitudes towards vaccination. So in the terms of who were hesitant or not. Uh, another thing we saw was that there were actual messages that got out into the community and there was a, there's a number of them. There was a Time Magazine, which is kind of highlighted here. Um, article that actually highlighted the immunity community parent advocates and, and talked about them. There were local, there's a, another, over on the right is the Bellingham Herald and it has a whole um, uh, story about the immunity community. And so there were a number of these types of social media um, and, and general media uh, distribution of the program and the messages. And one of the ones being kind of situated in public health and health services that I was really excited about is that we had a policy change. And <clears throat> what happened was that at one of the um, cooperative preschools, it, the, the program actually got a lot of attention from the, the staff because they got really kind of upset about this and they went um, up to the, um, the organization, organizing body for the, all the pro cooperative preschools in the state of Washington. And what they did was they ended up changing their guidelines about how you, to, to, in benefit for, for, for tracking vaccinations, for how you actually track vaccinations at these cooperative preschools. These are made up of volunteers mostly. And um, so you had to, they said you had to appoint a vaccine person who's in charge of tracking vaccines for risk management purposes and that you had to do this yearly and they gave a whole process and they wrote it into their manual. So this has the potential to affect 10,000 families per year in the state of Washington. Um, so all of this is written up in our in a um, article in the, I think it's Health Promotion and Practice. Um, so I encourage you to go um, look that up if you want to see the details of some of our methods. Um, so the next thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is some of our related work and um, what we're doing now. So one thing that, this was actually a two-pronged, um, Vax Northwood had a two-pronged approach. So we had the um, immunity community for parents and then for providers we had another cam campaign and it I think very similarly was called Let's Talk Vaccines. That's what they ended up branding it. This was for providers and they actually did a randomized control trial of this approach. I was involved in the piloting stage so it, they used um, the, what they call the triple A's. It's things ask, um, ask, Acknowledge, that's right, ask, acknowledge, and advice. So you guys are all familiar with this. And um, so they used that approach and um, they tested it and, and, they've, and their main outcomes were physician confidence and par parent attitudes. Unfortunately, they, they had null findings with the, the randomized control trial. And it was based on an academic detailing approach. Um, some other things that we've done 
we tried um, to test this a multi-pronged approach where we had local health departments um, engage in them, try to organize the immunity community in their local area, um, do um, a mobile, do mobile immunization clinics, and then also or pop-up clinics, and um, also promote this school school nurse toolkit that they that we that was being developed. Um, that had really mixed. Um, kind of results and so we ended up kind of discontinuing that program. One, one um, local health department did really well and they actually lowered their, uh, their exemption rates significantly to kind of minimal and another just did, didn't do anything. So it really was dependent on the local health department and they also didn't really understand how to do the immunity community engagement in a way that um, within REACH who had been implementing it did and so there were problems there as well. Um, so the immunity community continues. We're actually right now doing um, focus groups. Uh, I'm leading that project where we're, we've targeted parents who have missed, skipped, or delayed vaccines, and we have actually excluded refusers, the, the high hesitancy refusers, and so it's really anybody who's hesitant, like a, a score on Doug Opal's of like seven and below. Um, and so those are really interesting. We've done two of those so far. We have one more planned with the Somali community in Seattle and another with a high Medicaid population. Um, and they're also revamping the immunity community website. And in the future, we're working to do some work around prenatal providers, um, similar to what's been being done in um, Vancouver, BC, and doing assessment and development of materials to address prenatal uh, providers and thinking about what we can incubate and support as the Vax Northwest. Uh, here's the revamped immunity community site, so I encourage you to go there and explore. It's open to the public, and it's got all the materials and everything on it. And final acknowledgments, I already acknowledged Jenny and uh, Mackenzie, but I also want to acknowledge the parent advocates who are just amazing and gave a lot of their time. And the Group Health Foundation is what funded our evaluation. So that's 